Hi, and welcome to this video from our benchmark webinar series. In this module, I will cover why tools are important in the CRISPR editing workflow. As a reminder, this is number one of our mini series that follows our full benchmark webinar. So if you haven't checked that one out, I highly recommend you view that webinar before looking at this one. So what will we cover in today's webinar? We're going to look at what tools are available for CRISPR editing, what other scientists are using, and how these differences may impact the outcomes of your CRISPR editing workflow. We'll also answer some questions like, is it viable to use enrichment protocols for CRISPR editing cell lines? So let's dive right in. For the CRISPR editing workflow, as we mentioned in the previous webinar, we covered what every single step of this is. So in this webinar, we're going to focus on guide synthesis and really looking at how that reagent choice influences the editing efficiency you'll get, the type of cells you can edit, as well as how the reagent choice can influence off-target and other unintended effects. So, what kind of reagents are available for CRISPR editing? So there's really been an evolution of CRISPR reagents. We started off leveraging plasmids in the early days of CRISPR. Now these are great for immortalized cell lines where we may not necessarily care how many edits, edited cells we have out of this. However, the field is moving away from plasmids because they can also have many unintended consequences. This includes the ability of that plasmid molecule to integrate into the genomic DNA of our host cell. Plasmid DNA is also relatively long lived as a molecule within the cell population that we have transfected. So this also increases the level of off targets found when we're editing cells with plasmids. Uh, in addition, we can't increase the baseline editing efficiency of plasmids by using chemical modifications like we can with other methodologies. Lastly, one of the, the potential benefits of using a plasmid is that we can leverage selection to enrich that population of cells. However, as I'll speak to uh, in, in part of this presentation, that may actually not be something that we want to do to ourselves. Another form of CRISPR editing is using lentivirus to transduce a population of cells with viral particles. So this again works very well for immortalized cell lines and can work for some primary cells. However, it is a well-documented fact that for some immune cells and for iPS cells, so they often react to lentivirus and can have an immune response to the, this virus being around their cells. And so you can get more cytotoxicity due to that immune reaction with lentivirus. So it may not be applicable to every cell type. In addition, it's very labor intensive to create lentivirus and it has the same issue as plasmids. Because lentivirus integrates into the genome, we get constitutive overexpression of the CRISPR components. So that means, as with plasmids, regardless of if that edit has already been made, those components, the Cas9 and that guide RNA, are continually to be, be expressed within that cell population. And this increases the off-targets across time. So even you may have a stable population that have been edited, if you still have that lentivirus producing those components, you're going to get a modification of that line because of those off-targets as that cell line progresses in culture. Uh, with lentivirus, you also can't chemically modify this, but however, you can utilize selection to enrich. And again, I'll cover why that may not necessarily be a desirable thing to do to our cells. Now, these are mostly non-synthetic methods, which usually you don't create uh, in a synthetic fashion, so they're not chemically synthesized. However, there are some formats that can be chemically synthesized and have and don't have some of these issues that I mentioned. So for example, we have CRISPR RNA or two piece uh, that can be purchased. However, this comes in two reagents, one that's CRISPR RNA and one that's tracer RNA. So these do require an annealing step to come together before you can transfect that 
reagent into the cells as a ribonuclear protein. So this also means that you get a reduction in, the, in editing efficiency, especially for those hard to transfect cells to begin with, such as primary cells and stem cells. Lastly, uh, and the reagent that we recommend is our synthetic single guide RNA. So this is not to be confused with a synthetic guide RNA, which sometimes this two piece is called, which sometimes is called an sgRNA, the S standing for synthetic in this case. What we mean here is a single synthetic guide RNA. So the difference between the two piece and the single guide is that the single guide is one continuous piece versus the two piece, which comes in two pieces, that you have to anneal, as I mentioned. So the synthetic single guide RNA can be purchased uh, from us and can be used as that single molecule and all you have to do is complex it to the Cas9 protein. Now, because there's very little handling and very, other, very minimal other processing, this means that it's very well tolerated by other cell types, such as immortalized cells, all the way through to very picky primary cells, like primary T cells, for example. And this, because it doesn't hang around in the cell for as long as a plasmid or a lentivirus, has reduced off-target effects uh, as well. So that's an added benefit of using those synthetic single-guide RNAs. These are also chemically modified, to enable much higher editing efficiency. And I'll show you an example of that as well. So these are lots of different options that you have. So what are other people like yourselves doing in the CRISPR space? So as part of the benchmark report, which as we discussed in the first webinar, we looked at what other scientists were using. And what we found is that the scientific community is largely moving towards using synthetic reagents. So when we, when we surveyed the, the field uh, a couple of years ago, we found that about 50% of customers about five years ago were using plasmid. However, this has now shifted to only about 35% using plasmid, whereas the synthetic CRISPR tracer and synthetic single guide RNA are growing segments. So people are, are switching away from plasmid, mostly due to the utility of synthetic guide RNAs. As I mentioned before, they are able to be transfected in lots of cell types and have much higher efficiencies while uh, increasing the, the accuracy of the edit. So we're reducing the off targets by not using plasmids or lentivirus, as I described before. So another data point that we got from this benchmark survey is how long people were taking to prepare their materials and how many attempts they needed to make. So uh, it was very surprising to us that most people spent an average of seven hours just hands on time preparing these guides. Now this is an immense amount of time. Uh, our synthetic single guide RNAs require only 10 to 15 minutes of preparation. So that's a huge, difference between seven hours and 15 minutes to prepare your reagents for a transfection. In addition, when using other reagents, it causes those success rates to really tank. So most scientists were seeing that they needed to attempt a CRISPR editing reaction at least seven times to be able to identify the correct population of cells or get high enough editing efficiency to be able to move on with the workflow. So by, by increasing the quality of our material, uh, not using things like plasmids, which can have much a lot of variability in the quality of that reagent, we can reduce the number of failed experiments and reduce the number of, of attempts that we have to do, the workload and the, the cost of doing a CRISPR experiment. So how can we do that? So I mentioned I will show you some data and I promised I would deliver. So here we're comparing different formats of synthetic guides. So just because you've chosen synthetic doesn't mean you're going to get the best outcomes in your experiment. So in this example, we have 39 different RNA guides that we've created in different formats. So in the black, we have our synthetic single guide RNA. In the green, we've made a CRISPR tracer molecule. We no longer sell this on the market, but we wanted to compare whether or not the sequence was responsible for the high efficiency or it was the format. So every row across here is exactly the same sequence of guide RNA. 
And then we've got two different vendors, uh, vendor D and vendor I and their CRISPR tracer molecule. So this is a very busy slide, but what you can see is there's some trends that start to fall out. Uh, one of the first examples is there is some guides that just don't work very well, regardless of the format that you leverage. And this is true of a lot of different guide RNAs. So we're not very good in the, in the field at predicting what a good guide looks like. So this really indicates that we should be testing multiple guides for any one target so that we avoid selecting a guide that's intrinsically going to have a low editing efficiency, regardless of how we edit it. And I should mention that here, we electroporated these guides. So we should be getting the high enough, a high efficiency, the highest efficiency we can usually get um, as electroporation usually gives us the highest editing efficiency. The second example is where we find that all of the guides, regardless of their format, work pretty well. Uh, here, one of the vendors didn't perform at all, uh, but in most cases, you could see if you ordered that guide in either CRISPR tracer or synthetic guide RNA, it would work pretty well. However, what we see in the majority of cases across the board is an example like this, where the synthetic guide RNA performs much better than any other format. So you can see here, this is a huge difference between potentially getting close to 100% editing efficiency and the nearest best at around 70% and often lower as well. So this really does suggest that your format is in integral to getting the highest efficiency possible. So talking about editing efficiency, what does a good editing efficiency look like? Well, it obviously differs for different people, the different reagents they're using, but from the benchmark report, we're able to report that an average editing efficiency from the people that we talked to was about 43%. However, when we do experiments, we find that our average editing efficiency is about 80%. So this is a huge difference. So how do we get such great editing efficiency? Well, check out the other series, uh, webinars in this series, and you can get pieces of information about how you can increase your editing efficiency, including this webinar. Uh, so obviously we, I've already shown you that using the correct reagents or the best reagents will increase your editing efficiency that you get from your experiments. And this is a really key part of doing any edit. The higher the editing efficiency you're going to get, uh, at the pool stage, the better off you're going to be all the way through the workflow and the better chances you're going to get of getting a population of cells that will actually be useful. So the last question that I wanted to address in this short segment is enrichment. So should you utilize enrichment? So as I mentioned at the beginning, there's two different reagents, both plasmids and lentivirus, that allow us to pull out a positive population of edited cells. And this is usually because they drag along with them some sort of uh, fluorescent protein or selection cassette that encodes for an antibiotic resistance gene. So if we apply antibiotics to that population of cells, only the cells that have that cassette will survive and all of the other cells would die. So in that way, we're enriching for that population of cells. So unfortunately, enrichment can do some funny things to our cells and can often affect the biology of the cells that we're looking at in unpredictable ways. So this is just a a breakdown of some of the most common antibiotic resistance genes. And unfortunately, a lot of them cause chromosomal abnormalities, very similar ones, sometimes worse than the ones that we're looking to avoid by using CRISPR alone. So for example, puramycin causes chromosomal abnormalities. And now these will be random and varied across the entire genome. So it will be very hard to be able to distinguish uh, puramycin intended effect versus a CRISPR effect. Very similar uh, with geneticin, it can restore the function of tumor suppressor genes that have nonsense mutations, so ones that cause stop codons, and increase that production of that protein. So you can imagine if you're trying to make a knockout and you're increasing or adding G418 or geneticin to your cells, you can then overcome the ability of those cells to have a knockout. 
And lastly, zeacin is kind of like a CRISPR on steroids. So zeacin, in it, the way that it functions, is it cleaves DNA. This is exactly what CRISPR does, but CRISPR does it in a very controlled manner. So by applying zeacin to ourselves, we're essentially allowing our genome to have lots of different breaks in it, which would either get repaired by non-homologous end joining and cause potentially knockouts all across the genome, or that cell will die due to too much DNA damage. But we could also have that intermediate where the cell doesn't die, but does incur a lot of other changes that again are completely random. So it's very hard to track what these antibiotics are doing. So we argue that if you can get high enough editing efficiency, we should not need selection and we don't need to necessarily risk the biological integrity of our cells and apply these types of selective agents. If you want more information, I highly recommend checking out the review that I've cited below as it goes into much more detail into this area. And I think it's a really important thing that we need to be considering with our research because we obviously want to do research that is very meaningful and doesn't have as many artifacts because obviously that reduces the relevancy of the work that we do. So I hope I've convinced you that tools matter. Synthetic single guide RNA is very quickly becoming the industry standard. It can reduce hands-on time for making these experiments happen. It can increase your editing efficiencies and thereby increase your overall experimental success rates. It can reduce off-target effects. And if you get high enough efficiency, we no longer need harmful antibiotics that can influence the biology of our cells, cells in unpredictable ways. So thank you for listening. And please check out the other videos in this series where I go through some of the other very important steps in the CRISPR workflow, such as optimization, analysis, single cell cloning, and then lastly, look at how you can do CRISPR in other ways, such as outsourcing it, to really get the most bang for your buck. Thank you for joining me. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us at synthego.com slash contact and please check out our website as we have many many resources on all of these different topics there for you to peruse thanks for joining me and i'll see you next time <laughs>